Well, thank you for joining us. My name is Rita Weeb, and welcome to Aging with Attitude. For those viewers that have been following our show, as you know, each episode is a little bit different. Um, it's geared toward the 45 to 64 age demographic, you know, th largely those people that are going into life's second half. And of course, any age that supports a, hol a holistic way of going into that second half of life. So today we have, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about citizen science and it's that, um, that wisdom that starts to be acquired from as we get older. And today we have with us Mike Morris. He's going to be talking a little bit about his own um, citizen science and what he does on the side. Well, thanks very Mike. much for that, Rita. You know, it was interesting you talk about wisdom. I just go back to a little story. I was heading out the door one day and my little five-year-old grandson was there and he says, Granddad, he said, what are all those cracks around your eyes? And I said, wisdom. And he says, oh, and turned around, he walked away again. But, but it is, we all acquire wisdom and we all require or acquire experience in, in a vast array of different life uh, experiences. Mine has been, uh, you know, quite remarkable as well. I've had experiences as a trapper, an outdoors person, as a policeman, now as a politician, um, as a father, as a granddad. But, uh, you know, my most memorable experience and my passion in life today is around biodiversity and wildlife and the outdoors. And that's what trapping has brought to me uh, over the years. It's given me the opportunity to, to study up close all the different species, including, you know, uh, mice and voles and the different bird species that we have because it's all part of the biodiversity management area. It's part of the food chain for all the different animals that we have out there. So it's, it's been a great experience. It's been, uh, you know, it uh, has built upon weeks and months by myself out in the bush where you have nothing to do but look at the wilderness and the wildlife around you and the flora and fauna and those experiences. Well, you know, that whole lived experience, it's, it's so much different than what the researchers are, are telling us. But it seems that, you know, when we're talking about this biodiversity, now what you're actually seeing as a lived experience citizen scientist is really started starting to mesh with what the researchers are saying. Is that, is that true? It, it is, you know, it, it's, I'm hoping that the, the academic side will start relying a little bit more upon uh, citizen science. Uh, because it is a valuable component. You just can't walk on the books by themselves. Uh, and, you know, chaps like myself and others who have hunted and fished and trapped on the same area for decades uh, understand the environment in which we work. You know, every, every little beaver pond that has dried up, uh, every tree that's been cut down and new growth has come in around it, or uh, a flood or a forest fire, something comes through and changes the whole landscape, we live through that and we see it years and decades after the fact and we can, we can talk about the changes and we can probably reinforce a lot of the, the theories that academics have uh, with the experiences that we've seen right on the land base itself. Yes, and, I, and you know, I've been looking at this manuscript you wrote and I just want to read one portion of it and it's, um, it says, harness the wisdom, talent and expertise of BC wildlife practitioners in wildlife habitat management. Now this was something that um, you wrote a few years back, a very good bibliography. Tell us a little bit about this document. Yeah, so that was the report uh, um, back in 2014, Christy Clark was a premier at the time, asked me if I would do a prov uh, province-wide review on wildlife habitat. And uh, so I embarked on that and traveled around the province and, and uh, looked at a number of things. And the report called Getting the Balance Right was the culmination of, of the work that I did. Um, I think I published that in 2015 through the Forest and Lands Natural Resource Operations Ministry. And uh, so citizen science was, a, um, you know, traveling around the province and talking to the technicians, talking to uh, the men and women who were registered wildlife biologists and registered professional foresters and uh, who are out on the land and, and they balance everything against the, the academic standards that they've, uh, that they've um, learned. But the part of it that was missing was uh, the experiences of people like myself, but other people around the Prince George area. The Prince George Trappers Association has about 60 members here in Prince George or more. And uh, there's uh, fellows that have been out on their lines for 60 years and they know every aspect of it. You could drop them there in the middle of the night and they'd wake up in the morning and they know exactly where they were. And they can tell uh, all the profound changes that we see, particularly from forestry. And, and my line is, is no different. The pine beetle hit my line uh, 20 years ago and uh, it was logged heavily. And the fur bearer population 
virtually disappeared and uh, the, the Fisher population and the Martin population. That's had a, a significant impact there to the point where we may have to reintroduce animals to reestablish those populations again. Uh, th there's a tendency for government, uh, there's a tendency for corporations to want to continue studying everything, but I think there is all kinds of data already available, um, not only from citizen science, but also from previous studies that have been done over the past 50, 60, 70 years that will add value to any decision making in the future, but citizen science will form a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So back in the days of um, the trapping days, what would a typical day look like? Like I can just envision you in, in snowshoes and big snowy hat and give us a little bit of a visual there on what you would have looked like. Well, it, it, yeah, it starts uh, in October. Well, actually trapping is all year round. You go out there all year round working on trails and making sure you have enough wood in your cabin for the winter. But uh, the season opens up mid-October and, and you trap for beaver and that's what you use for uh, bait for a lot of the other animals out there. But when all your traps are set and at, you know, at the height of the season around the beginning of November, I may have a couple of hundred traps out uh, over the space of uh, you know, 100, 200, 300 kilometers on, on my snow machine or whatever machine I was using at the time. So you get up when it's dark and you have your breakfast and you pack your tea or your coffee and, and a bit to eat and you jump on your snow machine and you go and you check traps all day long. You're off your machine, you know, you might have traps every 500 meters, they might be a kilometer apart, they, you might have to travel uh, 10 kilometers on a, on a trail to get to another area of your trap line. And uh, so you're out all day, you know, if it's minus 20, minus 15, or plus 5, doesn't matter what the weather conditions are, and, and it's quiet, you enjoy it other than the noise of your machine. And every afternoon at about uh, 3.30, I would have a favorite spot that I would always stop at, and I would sit backwards on my snow machine and, and uh, rest up against the handlebars, pour a cup of tea, and uh, I used to smoke a pipe at the time, and just as the sun was going down, and I'd listen to all the sounds. You'd hear the wolves howl, you'd hear the different animals making sounds or you just hear nothing but quiet. And uh, that was part of the experience of trapping, just getting away. It was like taking an aspirin the size of this table. It just settled you right down and, and uh, put you back in touch with reality. And did you ever contemplate what you've seen out there insofar as, you know, how people treated our forests and that sort of thing? And did you ever get any feedback about, you know, trapping animals? We're just about to go into our break, so maybe something you can make really short. Yeah, no, I, I have, you know, and I've, I've seen all kinds of issues with forestry and I've, I speak to the, uh, the civic culture people uh, with it on my trap line on a regular basis to try and mitigate some of the, the clear cuts and some of the work that they do. And, uh, you know, but uh, again, forestry has been the primary focus uh, that's been a myopic view of the province and government and, and industry itself and uh, wildlife populations have taken a secondary um, stance in this, so uh, we need to change that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what are some of the things that you can think of right now that people could do to change that? Or well, get involved. Spruce City Wildlife is a great organization locally here in town. It's resident hunters, it's outdoor enthusiasts, it's, it's hikers, and uh, people that are passionate about conservation. Uh, you know, not just hunters, but passionate about conservation. And uh, get involved with those groups because they do some great work when it comes to salmon habitat. They have, of course, a, a hatchery at the, uh, the building here in town. But anybody that likes picking wild blueberries or huckleberries or getting out in the great outdoors and just viewing wildlife, an organization like that would, uh, you know, they need all the help they can get. And uh, the participation of more of the public, I think, would make that a more viable organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and it's great that you're mentioning some of, the, uh, some of the various community organizations and that sort of thing. What about just the people that are, say, out walking around Cottonwood Island Park? Yeah, no, uh, you know, if, there's any, if they have any issues, we have a multitude of, of specialists, of uh, citizen science, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, within Spruce City Wildlife, uh, but at the university, uh, the BC Trappers Association, the Prince George Local, uh, you know, there's a number of local organizations, or even my office here in town is the MLA. Uh, anybody wants to talk to me about wildlife issues, I'm game. You know, my calendar gets plugged up pretty quick, but uh, um, it, it's an area I'm passionate about, and uh, there's so many changes that I'd like to make in biodiversity management in the province, uh, so I have a lot of work ahead of me before uh, I decide to hang, hang up my spurs. And so those people that are sort of feeling that same sense of passion about the wildlife out there, the forestry, that sort of thing, you're wel you welcome them, you know, they do have something to say and something to contribute? Oh, by all means they do, yeah. And, uh, it, you know, two heads are better than one.
Yeah, well, this is, um, it's all very good to know. So, you know, we are going to be going into our break pretty quick here in, say, about a minute or so. So when we come back, you know, just maybe giving some thought to um, just those animals that, you know, that you see and, and the moose and the wolves and the, the, our, the ATV lines out there in the bush that the wolves are following and that sort of thing. Yep. No, uh, well, we can spend the whole afternoon talking about that part of it, for sure. So when yeah. we come back after a short break, we, we, we can, you know, talk about that a little bit, but we have just one minute left. Is there something that you can tell us just in, in well, one no, minute? You know, the, the whole landscape has changed over the last uh, several decades. Um, we have 700,000 kilometers of resource roads in the province that, uh, you know, have had a detriment on, uh, on wildlife populations as well. And uh, so that needs to be addressed. Uh, the province has opened up. We have logged a su substantial number of clear cuts in British Columbia. Uh, every year we log the equivalent of the Greater Vancouver Regional District as far as clear cut areas go. And a lot of that has come back, but uh, we, got, we got room for an improvement, I'll put it that way. Years ago, when I used to go out in the bush, there, there were areas that had not been cut. Uh, no forest activity uh, had taken place in there. We'd cut trails into remote lakes and. And the wildlife that you would see was phenomenal. Uh, you know, moose and their calves and uh, coyotes and their young pups and, and uh, just a multitude of different uh, birds and raptors and, and uh, animals. And that's changed over the years just because of the amount of harvesting that's taken place and the am amount of habitat that's disappeared uh, uh, out there. Uh, m it wasn't unusual to see marten. You know, a lot of people have never seen a pine marten, but they're very, they were very prolific in the province here. And uh, if you knew where to look and, and you were quiet enough when you walked through the bush, uh, they were all over the place. Oftentimes I would see them. And, and Fisher the odd time. I've seen Wolverine. Um, I've been chased down by a Wolverine, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, been charged by bears. I've seen bears uh, up close and personal uh, a few times. So, it, but it's, it's a life that, um, uh, you know, I really subscribe to. And uh, it, like I said, you know, my role as a police officer was always busy and you're always dealing with uh, some very violent situations or graphic situations. And, and I found trapping and uh, the outdoors was a good way to settle down and, and get away from a lot of that stuff. So, you know, uh, initially, you know, one of my cabins, uh, the trapper that owned it previous to a family member that I bought it from, uh, had the uh, number of marten that he would harvest in a year. Uh, written on the wall of the cabin in the early 70s. You know, it wasn't unusual to see 180 in a, in a season or 200 in a season. And that was only a small part of, of my trap line. Today, I don't trap that area because there's none left uh, uh, from a Martin perspective. Um, so the numbers have depleted. Uh, whiskey jacks, you know, another bird that I, I've seen, everybody have seen whiskey jacks and I fed them out of my hand before uh, years ago. I haven't seen a whiskey jack for about five or six years uh, around my cabin area. They, uh, they require uh, mature canopy. You know, they stash all their food for the winter and they hide it in the trees and that's what they survive on over the winter months uh, to a large extent. So th the habitat has changed and, uh, you know, I want to bring it back to the way it was when I was a young boy uh, for my grandchildren. I take my grandkids out uh, every once in a while and, uh, you know, they'll help me run the snow machine and they're the first one off the machine and run off into the set to see whether we have any animals in there. And if we have one, I can hear, got one, granddad. And, you know, so we, we harvest that. And, and if, if, you, if you watch out, uh, if you watch what you have, if you watch the, uh, like the, the Martin, one of the primary sources of food for them was a red back bull that required, you know, they, uh, they required uh, mature force as well. Uh, or the birds and the mice, and you just watch that and see what kind of habitat you have to see what kind of, of population you can trap that year without really affecting the population overall. Uh, you know, I would trap, and as soon as I started getting too many females or adult uh, marten, then I would pull all my traps because uh, the, they're a very territorial animal, as an example. And when they leave the den in the, in the late fall uh, and they cross another marten's territory, it's a fight to the death. And of course, Martin are cannibalistic, like all carnivores are, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they will eat one another. So you try to get them before they get to that stage mm -hmm. and balance your populations out. Same with the beaver, you watch the colonies very closely because beaver have a habit of eating themselves out of house and home. 
and then they'll starve to death and, and uh, there won't be any left for several seasons after that. So you try and balance those populations out. Mm -hmm. There's a number of things you, that we do from a citizen science perspective to try and maintain a, a, a firm management plan within your trap line so that you have um, a harvestable population every year. You don't get rich at it, but it does cover your expenses. There is a market for fur, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, you know, China is a big market, but so is Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, so is Russia, and so is Korea, and, and the United States, and you know, a lot of the fur. Prince George has a fur depot that, you know, we, we would ship uh, from the fur depot in Prince George two, three, four million dollars worth of fur every year, mm -hmm. uh, of wild fur from British Columbia. So, so question. Um, what do you do with the meat? Do you eat the meat or do you sell the meat or is it used or? No, uh, so I give it back to the animals. You know, there's not one bit of protein, contrary to what some people think, uh, you know, if you shoot something and just take the fur off it, the rest goes to waste. It, there's not one piece of protein that goes to waste in the bush. I'll take all the carcasses back out and feed them back to the animals that would eat them in the first place, just minus the fur and uh, those carcasses would be gone overnight or sometimes in a few hours. So um, it's, it's, it's always given back to the land. The odd time I've, I've eaten lynx meat. You know, if I've been out, uh, like I said, uh, you know, on holidays, I would take a month holiday and I'd go out and just spend it out by myself on the trap line. And uh, a couple of times I've had to harvest a lynx and, and use that for, for protein when I was out there. Mm -hmm. Mm, interesting. So what's the, the, the societal benefits on trapping? That's one question. And my other question is, what, how do you feel or what do you think the young kids, your grandchildren feel about or Do they learn anything with your teaching them the, about trapping and, and management like that? Well, I, I hope they do. You know, the, the, you know they, they learn from watching me do things and talking about the different uh, animals that we have. The societal benefit of trapping is it's a renewable resource. It's not a synthetic uh, fox fur or a nylon or a polyester that you wear and you throw away and it takes years to degrade sometimes. It's a renewable resource. So you can, you grow fur every year and the leather and you harvest it. And uh, you know, there, there's fur coats around that have lasted for well over a hundred years. Uh, they're very, they're warm. There's nothing warmer than genuine fur. And uh, so it's, it's a product, if it's managed right, uh, it enhances the population. It doesn't decrease the population and nature is vicious. You know, if you watch how, how animals treat one another and how they kill each other and, and uh, the, the damage that they inflict upon other species, uh, it, it's, a, it's a vicious life cycle. But it's vicious in a wonderful sense. You know, when you watch that, I've watched um, wolves bring down moose several times. Um, I've watched bears attack other bears and kill other bears. I've watched a squirrel kill another squirrel. You know, the, everything is territorial out there and they all have their own um, area that you don't dare venture in if you're of the same species. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful world that we live in, nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you spend all those hours and days in, out in that, out in the wilderness, do you ever get scared? No, um, there, there's really nothing out there that scares you. The, the only thing that you have to be prepared for is uh, an accident or uh, adverse weather that will blow in very quickly and you have to make sure you got the right conditions for that. Um, I, I've been disoriented a couple of times and but you have to just sit there and, and gather your thoughts and be prepared to spend the night if you have to, which I could, no problem. And But once you uh, sit down and have a look around and, and figure out where you are. I've always been able to get out. I've never been so lost that I've had to spend a night in the bush, but uh, um, you just keep your thoughts about it. You never get, get into a hurry, never run, uh, so that you increase your chances of tripping and falling down and hurting yourself. Uh, give yourself enough time that if you're running out of daylight to make sure that you get your job done or your trip done before it gets dark, just in case anything happens and you have to walk back. I always carry a, a firearm with me in the event that, uh, um, you know, there's a couple of times where bears and wolves have been interested in me when I've been walking and, and it's uh, satisfying to know that you're equipped to deal with them if they decide to take a close look at you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's, that's good to be prepared. And if you're on snowshoes, how do you feel if you're on snowshoes? Because you can't run very fast on snowshoes. No, you can't. Uh, and like I said, and I don't run. So I, I would never run from, from an animal either. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, the odd time I've had to run at an animal to show them that I was the aggressor and I was capable of handling myself. But uh, most of my, my trips are on snowmobile. I've, I've done some snowshoeing uh, over the years. 
um, when I've had to walk into remote sets. But uh, other than that, uh, most of my sets are within 100 feet of where the snowmobile is. And because you check them on a regular basis, you've got a well-worn trail as the snow gets deeper and deeper and deeper. In some of my area, uh, trap line area, the snow can get to 10 or 12 feet deep. So uh, if you have a regular trail that you go in, you don't have to buckle those snowshoes on and take them off every time you get on and off the skidoo. And what kind of an area is your trap line in? So I go uh, Bear Lake and, and I'm either, uh, I'm east and west of Bear Lake. I go as far north as Red Rocky Lake. Uh, I go west to Whedon Lake and south to the north end of Summit Lake. And then over on the east side of the highway, uh, just about down to the Tachita Lakes, uh, that area there. So it's a wonderful part of the province. And I've got, you know, hills and mountains and uh, spruce and pine, quite a mixed forest that has uh, different things uh, that offer different opportunities, um, as well as lots of lakes and creeks. So, you know, when it comes to trapping the water animals like otter and beaver and muskrat and, and mink and whatnot, there's quite a variety of those available for that as well. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you ever take researchers out into the forest with you, like whether they be forestry researchers or animal researchers or anything like that, or are you the citizen scientist? Well, I, I guess I'm the citizen scientist. I've done lots of reading. Uh, I've probably read hundreds of research papers on just about every species that I trap, and, uh, and I garner a lot from that. I've attended a lot of forums. Uh, I've been a member of the BC Trappers Association for 30 or 40 years. And uh, every year they hold their AGM and conference. We have specialists come in and present uh, with, their, with their films and their scientific studies. And, and so you garner a lot from that. Uh, but also hanging around other citizen scientists, like all the other trappers. If we have three or 400 trappers gathering together at a convention, most generally we'll see lots of gray hair and wrinkles and experience. And uh, they have a lot of stories to tell, which we can learn from. So we're, uh, we're about to wrap it up here. Um, is there anything that you can, you know, any pieces of advice that you can give to people who may be interested in this topic, what they might be able to do, who they can phone if they can attend some kind of an educational session? Yeah, so like I said, the BC Trappers Association have a website. Uh, so just query them and, and uh, see what they have to offer. Most or several communities in the province have a local uh, association that are as affiliated with BC Trappers. Like I said, Prince George has 60, 70 members uh, that show up uh, at meetings on a regular basis. Uh, join the local Trappers Association. Um, see if you can go out. Like, uh, you, know, you know, when I was actively trapping, if somebody wanted to go out with me three or four times or half a dozen times to get to know what it was all about, I would gladly take them. And I'm sure most of the other trappers would do that as well. Same with the guide outfitters, uh, same with the wilderness tour operators. Anybody that, you know, moves up here from urban British Columbia and wants to become indoctrinated as to what's going on in the bush, there's a, there's a, n a number of people around that would be more than willing to take you out. Like I said, Spruce City Wildlife is an organization that I have a lot of time for. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of members there that would take people out as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Mike, it's been interesting. I want to thank you for joining us and sharing that piece of expertise. It's been my pleasure. I, I enjoy talking about this, and uh, I'm going to spend some time out there in August. Well, and thank you for joining us on, um, on the viewers on, on watching this show. Um, my name is Rita Weeb. This is Aging for Attitude, and until next time.